legalization applications, others was dealing with asylum applications, others, others was working on immigration related job issues, such as not getting, uh, not getting uh, overtime pay, not getting fair pay, uh, or dealing, in dangerous, uh, dealing with dangerous working conditions. So as a teacher, uh, as I said, I've required my students to work in, in, uh, in, in a practical training setting, as well as coming to class for, for two hours of, of, of class session readings. Uh, it benefited the community organizations and the immigrants that they served, and students also gained new experiences that informed class discussions and brought immigration law to life. Today, those of us committed to advancing civil rights in a changing California, now a changing nation, uh, have much to be concerned about. The original topic of this talk focused on California because you belong to a state institution. However, a full and serious discussion of civil rights and recognizing UCLA's stature as a national university really requires a broader view. And the times require it as well. Just this past week in Cleveland, Alex Acosta, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, the first Latino to hold that position, appointed by President Bush, stated that the heavy lifting of the civil rights era is over. Now, I know Alex. Uh, worked with him at the end of my term as Special Counsel for Immigration-Related Unfair Employment Practices uh, and in his first days in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, I was a holdover Clinton appointee on immigrant civil rights. Uh, I expected the, the new Bush administration people in 2001 would try to keep us from enforcing anti-discrimination <coughs> provisions of the law in a meaningful way. Instead, through Alex, we had the green light to bring the largest action ever under our statute against meatpacking plants in the Midwest, throughout the Midwest, who had separate hiring procedures for people born in the United States and for people born outside the United States. Alex was supportive, and he was later heralded by Maldef for his work on government services for non-English speakers and has made protecting smuggled and abused immigrants a priority for his division. But now, at least according to the Cleveland Plain Dealer news account, Acosta, the nation's chief enforcer of the civil rights laws, says that, quote, this is his quote, a line has been crossed in American history. The article continued, the civil rights era is over, he said. A better era has begun. Now, Alex says he is misquoted, and I, I hope that is the case, because the notion that we as a nation have advanced so far that we can close the door to the civil rights era is misguided and ignores the changing composition of the nation. It ignores some evolving views of what it takes to be an American and the serious inequities that continue to exist. And I hope that the reporter misunderstood or misstated the comparison between the civil rights era and a better era. The comparison should be with the era of segregation and official condemnation of those people who look or sound out of the mainstream, and not a supposedly finite civil rights era. By contrast, many believe, and I join them, that the civil rights era was the height of activism, involvement, civic engagement, dialogue, painful perhaps, but necessary, a patriotism to make America as great as we believe it to be. We are better because of the civil rights era and for battles that must continue to be waged. Today, immigration and civil rights are inextricably linked. Our future is based upon immigration. Not just the future of the Latino or the Asian American communities, not just the future of the city of Los Angeles, where in less than six weeks we will have an election, where whether we elect the first Latino mayor of Los Angeles since the 1800s or not, we will certainly see record registration and turnout of Latino and other immigrant voters. <clears throat> Nor does immigration define solely the future of the great state of California, or California, as our governor calls it. <laughs> I'm talking about the nation's future. Every family, every industry, and every community is now linked to immigration policy. Consider some relatively recent developments over the past five years. And I see a couple of my former Maldives colleagues over in the corner. Uh, Maldef, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, closed its 30-year-old office in San Francisco and opened up a new office in Atlanta. Clark County, Nevada, also
also known as Las Vegas, is the fastest growing county in the nation when it comes to Asian American and Latino populations. At my other old office, the Office of Special Counsel uh, for Immigration Related Unfair Employment Practices, uh, more of our attention and work was on and in not the traditional big five states of immigration, California, Texas, New York, Florida, and Illinois, but on North Carolina, on Georgia, Iowa, Nebraska. And we were in Iowa and Nebraska uh, to keep an eye on INS, because they were already there uh, working, with the, uh, working on the meatpacking issues, uh, and, and some of the work is there through something called Operation Vanguard. One of the interesting things about uh, being a part of the Department of Justice, which is different today than it has been in the past, used to be that uh, the INS was part of the Department of Justice. Now the INS is, has a new name, which is, I don't know how to the name of it, it's ICE or uh, something like that, uh, but it is now part of the Department of Homeland Security. When you do that, the immigration issues in the federal government have been in the past Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, Department of Justice, because immigrants and immigration have different aspects to them. Some deal with our international trade and commerce, some of them deal with labor issues and worker issues, some of them deal with justice issues. Now, the INS, or its, its successor, is part of the Department of Homeland Security, and that necessarily puts a solely a focus of security threat, suspicion on immigrants, unnecessarily. There are obviously security issues dealing with our immigration policy and illegal immigration. But one of the problems of putting INS into the Department of Homeland Security is giving it that focus of security, elevating that over the other issues. And second is that it, since it's no longer part of the Department of Justice, uh, it, the Civil Rights Division, or, which I was a part of, which would, we would be able to go to, the, to Attorney General Janet Reno and say, well, INS is doing this. It really doesn't comport with your civil rights mandate. Let's work it out and let's reconcile it. She was very supportive of our efforts to reconcile INS's work with, with, with civil rights uh, concerns. Uh, one of the issues, one of the reasons we were in, in Iowa and Nebraska is because of an operation that INS was doing with the Social Security Administration. When we went out to talk to Social Security about it, they really had no idea that there was this, this office dealing only with immigrant civil rights. But we were able to get INS, Social Security, Labor Departments, and us all in the same room trying to reconcile all of these issues. That is more difficult now that INS is out of the Department of Justice. And finally, one other uh, indicia of the impact of immigration and language uh, is in the popular culture itself. Fully 47% of minor league baseball players were born outside the mainland United States. The Dodgers radio network has stations in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada. And that's no big deal. But it has one FM radio station in Gastonia, North Carolina, for Spanish language broadcasts. And in city after city, the top rated local news station doesn't broadcast in English. I'm less familiar with local Los Angeles politics, uh, but in San Francisco, Spanish language and Chinese language local TV and print media often cover City Hall more extensively than the mainstream press and stations. And speaking of the upcoming mayoral election here, I am told that the Chinese and Korean language newspapers have had an extraordinarily difficult time finding characters in their languages that sound like the Amargosa. <laughs> By contrast, Han is a very well-known Asian <laughs> Immigration and civil rights issues have so much in common. It's the result of over a century of legal and social policies that delayed the entry and assimilation of immigrants into American society. From the outright bars to Asian immigration in the late 1800s to the early 1920s national origin quotas that were intended to keep the immigration stream constantly and predominantly European, our immigration policies gave great opportunities to those who benefited from them, close the door to others based upon race and national origin. Three laws enacted 40 years ago, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Immigration Act, also of 1965, together and separately have dramatically changed the face of the nation and have helped us to live true to our national ideals of equality. As we examine civil rights and the change in California and country,
and discrimination against Latinos and other immigrants today, a major part of the solution to the problems involves naturalization and citizenship. Naturalization and citizenship empower the community to register to vote and elect public officials. Just in the past four presidential election cycles, the number of Latino voters jumped from 4.2 million in 1992, 4.9 million in 1996, 5.9 million in the year 2000, to over 7 million last year. By another yardstick, Naleo, the National Association of Latino <coughs> Elected and Appointed Officials, has estimated the number of Latino elected officials rising 28% just in the past two full election cycles, to close to 5,000 today. The Voting Rights Act and Immigration Act come together in another way. The Voting Rights Act ended the ways of the Old South, and with the return migration of African Americans, often professionals, from northern cities, the Voting Rights Act brought hopes of a new South in the 1970s, led by mayors like Maynard Jackson, Andrew Young of Atlanta, Dutch Morial of New Orleans, and, and later Harvey Gant of Charlotte, North Carolina. Until the start of the middle, of, until the start of the modern civil rights era, the South was solidly democratic, and democratic with a big D, just as solidly against civil rights. Of the 22 United States senators representing the 11 southern states, 21 voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now I should pause here because at election time, some political activists, talk show hosts, and bloggers conclude that Republicans were somehow more supportive of civil rights generally at that time. I would refer them and you to Dwayne Lockhart's 1968 analysis of state legislative votes on anti-discrimination laws. Lockhart examined over 30 state roll call votes from 1944 to 1963 and concluded that Democratic state legislative delegations voted for them by a 90% or greater margin 23 times. Republicans did so only six times. 18 times Republican legislators were divided on the issue, although a majority voted in favor. Republicans voted against state fair housing and fair employment laws six times as often as Democrats. Uh, but I said, as I said, that's just a footnote, showing different ways to analyze and research a question. Getting back to the 11 southern states, 21 out of 22 Southern Senators, as I said, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But 24 years later, the Senators representing those same states voted 16 to 6 against the Bork nomination. And black empowerment through voting and other means in those states was the difference. The redistricting provisions of the Voting Rights Act and the provision that required Justice Department to clear voting changes in those states produced record black voter participation, and new members of Congress, like the former Freedom Marcher John Lewis, Barbara Jordan, Cynthia McKinney. At the same time, however, redistricting came with a price. By creating heavily majority black districts, some reapportionment plans left the remaining districts more white and more Republican. So one of those Georgia districts also produced Newt Gingrich. Other districts in the South have sent additional Republican household names to Washington, D.C., and today, the once yellow dog Democrats are now red dog Republicans. These 22 states have only three Democratic senators today, two from Arkansas and one from Louisiana. But this, too, is a snapshot on a changing nation. It is not the final word. Latinos mainly, but Asian Americans as well, as newcomers, either immigrants from other countries or migrants from other states, are changing the South yet again. Those of you who are my age, or who watch TV Land, or who fit in both categories, uh, will be familiar with the great mid-1960s rural renaissance of network television. Those are the days of the Andy Griffith Show, Petty Road Junction, Green Acres, and yes, of course, the Beverly Hillbillies, who were moving on up before Louise and George Jefferson did in the 1970s. One aspect of our research projects at the Western Regional Office of the Civil Rights Commission is how network TV managed to go from focusing on whites and only whites in rural areas in the 1960s to whites and only whites in urban areas in the 1980s and 1990s. The casts of Friends, Seinfeld, OC, and Baywatch hardly looked like New York City, Orange County, or Hawaii, but we'll leave that subject to another day. 
right now, it's back to Mayberry and Andy Taylor's Aunt B. Aunt B is from the real life town of Siler City, North Carolina. Now, if you go to Siler City, North Carolina today, you won't see Floyd the Barber, or Barney, or little Opie Taylor. If you ask for them around Siler City, your likely response will be, can't ask us to Opie? <laughs> Opie doesn't live here anymore. Today, Jordan Matthews High School in Siler City is 30% Latino. Chapman Middle School is 57% Latino. And Siler City Elementary School is 67% Latino. Overall, Siler City, 7,000 strong, has a population that is 36% foreign born. And among the foreign born, according to the 2000 census data, better than 5 eighths had been in the United States for less than five years. 80% came to the US since 1990. 100 times as many as had been in the United States prior to the passage of the 65 Immigration Act. And as, as you will note, Siler City's population becomes more heavily Latino the younger the slice of the population you examine. Statewide, 52% of North Carolina is under age 35. For Latino and North Carolinians, 77% are under age 35. The median age for Latinos is almost 10 years younger than the statewide average. Well, how are they faring? If you look at the Siler City Elementary School staff lists, you're not going to find a Latino name among the teachers, among the teacher's assistants, among any of the principal, the vice principal, the counselors. You won't find a Latino name anywhere on those staff lists. We know that Latinos, and to some extent, some Asian Pacific Americans, are lagging behind in education and employment opportunities. Some of the chief reasons are English language proficiency and newness in the United States. Without a doubt, naturalization and English language proficiency do close the discrimination gap, but they do not do so entirely. Immigrants, and people who perceive to be immigrants, continue to face obstacles to fair employment and glass ceilings when it comes to promotions today, irrespective of their qualifications. My most recent position before coming to Los Angeles was as director of the Discrimination Research Center in Berkeley. And let me share with you the findings of our October 2004 report. Names make a difference. The screening of resumes by temporary employment agencies in California. The Discrimination Research Center carefully crafted 20 different but similar resume types, purportedly depicting a recent college graduate relocating to California, looking for a front office type job. We chose temporary employment agencies because they are uniquely situated as gateways to permanent employment. More and more companies have downsized and outsourced their human resources operations to temp agencies, and they are often the bridge for women exiting welfare on their way to work. We sent a total of 6,200 resumes to temporary employment agencies across California the first study of an entire, of entire state in terms of employment in this, in this industry. From Sacramento to San Diego, Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area, the San Joaquin Valley, Bakersfield, the Inland Empire, Los Angeles. These resumes were evenly distributed as coming from 20 men and women with names that were closely associated with being Latino, Asian American, Anglo, African American, or Middle Eastern and South Asian. And we test marketed the names such as Jose Gonzalez, Jamal Anderson, Rosa Lopez, Timothy Wu, Heidi McKenzie, Christina Rodriguez, Abdul Aziz Mansour, and Mohammed Ahmed. If 100% of the people in our pretest correctly identified the group we wanted depicted, we used that name for the resumes. And here's an example of the resume that we use University of Oregon graduate, class of 2000. English major, played on the tennis team, worked in the admissions office during school, worked in an office following school, volunteered to tutor elementary school students as a hobby. Now this could describe maybe somebody in this room right now. Submitting that resume, the applicant could be a man or a woman of any race or of any ancestry. But when that resume was sent by Jose Gonzalez, it received a positive response from the temporary employment agencies 46.6% of the time. 
When it came from Jamal Anderson, the agencies responded 35% of the time. Rosa Lopez got a response 32% of the time. Joy Shu, 30% of the time. And Timothy Wu, only 29% of the time. Overall, Latinos did the best with a 33% response rate. Middle Easterners, especially the men, did the worst. 27% response rate, statistically significantly lower than everybody else. African Americans and whites were right around the statewide average. Asian Americans came in fourth. Now it is clear, concluding from that study, it is clear that September, post September 11th animosity greatly disfavors people with Middle Eastern or Southern Asian, uh, South Asian ancestries. Uh, overall, they, with, with the results of the other groups, there's, there's mixed. There's good news and bad news uh, uh, among the various different groups that we that we studied on the resumes. Asian Americans. Um, one of the one of the surprising results was that Asian Americans did, did so poorly uh, in in this study, uh, and we felt that Asian Americans may be perceived more negatively than others, notwithstanding their educational credentials. Asian American college graduates exceed the percentage of college graduates among whites by 44 to 30 percent. High school graduation rates among Asian Americans are far greater than those of Latinos and African Americans. Nonetheless, they're the only demographic group whose percentage among managers is far less, just 30 percent of their percentage among professional employees. For all other groups, the natural move up the career ladder from professional employee to manager is made with relatively few obstacles. For Asian Americans, their education, professional training, experience are not considered sufficient qualifications to be hired and promoted to be manager. Frankly, it does not help that Asian Americans complain less of discrimination than, than other ethnic or racial groups. Disparate treatment goes unchecked, making it even easier to pass over qualified Asian American employees the next time. As for Jose Gonzalez having the most sought after resume, even though it was identical to Timothy Wu and Muhammad Ahmed, that is a good thing for Latinos. Latinos may be doing better in the white collar sector. The real challenge is not that Latinos are not getting hired, it is that many have years to go before they or their children will reach that sector. Meanwhile, they are hired for and mired in jobs that are low in pay and dangerous in condition. There are myriad policy areas affecting immigrants and the economy. I've just mentioned a few. Social security reform cannot be discussed without assessing the impact of totalization agreements with U.S. and Latin American countries, the subsidy that immigrants provide by paying into the system and not having parents collect from the system, and the future of benefits and payout rates for Latinos and African Americans. As immigration patterns across, across the entire country, more and more local communities are, for the first time, struggling with how to address day labor issues, driver licenses, banking issues, and police community cooperation. In the absence of federal action, immigration policy devolves back to state and local governments, where it has not been since, that has not been there for the last 100 years. Local immigration policies run the spectrum from things like Special Order 40, uh, governing the LA Police Department, to safe havens, to deputization of local law enforcement officials to enforce the immigration laws. And now we have the, the Real ID Act. It passed the House. It's now pending in the United States Senate. There's a provision to encourage bounty hunters to go after people with deportation orders. And we have what even President Bush described as vigilantes lying in wait north of the Arizona-Mexico border this month to give assistance to the Border Patrol. Assistance that the Border Patrol has been singular in saying it does not need, it does not want. Civil rights and immigration policy continue to be a major challenge. And we in this room as students, teachers, researchers, advocates, have a lot to do. We have a lot at stake, all of us. But when we think of immigrants or people of color, like Wong Kim Ark, a laborer born in San Francisco in the 1870s, he was not allowed back into the United States after a trip outside the country because the government said he was not a United States citizen. He was born in the 1870s, a laborer at the age of 22, 
He had to go all the way to the United States Supreme Court uh, in 1898 for the Supreme Court to say that the law is that if you're born in the United States, you're a United States citizen. Using the post-Civil War amendments that had, that had been designed to address um, the problems that were in the original uh, uh, in the original Constitution of, 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 of divisions of races, um, that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments apply not just to African Americans, but to, to, to all Americans. Well, Wong Kim Ark was 22 years old. He had to go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to vindicate his rights. And rights that today uh, are still under attack. There are some members of Congress who want to have an amend amendment to the Constitution to say that it just because you're born in the United States doesn't make you a U.S. citizen. The Wong Kim Ark, the age of people like you, had to go all the way to the Supreme Court for that right. Raymond Parpart. Raymond Parpart was a fifth grade student uh, in, um, in Hamilton County, Nebraska. Uh, his teacher, Mr. Meyer, uh, was teaching German in the classroom. And that was against the law of the state of Nebraska and some other Midwestern states in the 1920s who said English was the official language of the state and you couldn't teach German in, in the classroom uh, to, to elementary school students. It was okay later on, but not at the elementary school level. And Raymond Parpard and his teacher challenged that, challenged that, uh, that, that action. They went to the Nebraska District Court. They lost. They went to the Nebraska Appeals Court. They lost. They went to the Nebraska Supreme Court. They lost. What was the argument on the other side? Well, the Nebraska official said, the brain is too small at that age. You can't have two different languages. It's confusing for the kids. And you never know what they're talking about. You know, they may be plotting something, these fifth graders, in uh, another language. Those are the arguments that, that sometimes are made today about people who speak Spanish or, 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 or are being, being taught about legal education. Well, Raymond, and his teacher had to go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 1923, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, you're, you, Raymond, and Mr. Meyer, you, you are right. Now, if you go to the Supreme Court, you'll see up on, up on the wall, if you go, it's an equal justice under law. Well, this fifth grade teacher, this fifth grade student and his teacher went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1923, and the U.S. Supreme Court was right when it said the protection of the Constitution extends to all. To those who speak other languages, as well as to those born with English on the tongue. And then the Supreme Court got it right in 1923, but it took a teacher and a student to go all the way to the Supreme Court to get that ruling. Fred Korematsu just passed away last week. He was a welder. Again, someone close to the age of, of, many, of you, many of you in this room. He was a welder, lived in Northern California. He fought the order. He defied the order to be interned with other Japanese Americans during, during World War II. Again, Someone young went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to, to vindicate his, his rights as an American. <coughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, who was assassinated this week 37 years ago, at, at the, in, his, in his 20s, he was already giving commanding speeches in Washington and around the country as a community leader. So we know how important civil rights is to shaping and improving the nation, and that our, that our work is not complete simply by passing laws but by living the struggle and marshalling, marshalling the facts and research that universities uncover and produce to make this a better nation. We all have something to contribute, and we can do it in this room, we can do it on this campus, we can do it in government offices, but we need to do it, we need to do it together. So I thank you for your time and your efforts today and every day. I invite your questions and look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks very much. On the job applicants, weren't you surprised that the Latino did better than the Caucasian, whatever you want to use, than the American Corps? Yes, we, we, we were. How do you account for that? Well, you know, normally when, you, when you're when you working at a discrimination, discrimination research center, a group like that, civil rights organization, you're going to, you sort of expect to get bad news. <laughs> and here, you got some good news. And, and that is that Latinos were, were faring pretty well. We are... Our conclusions on that setting were that because Latino college graduates in, in, as an English major who are doing this kind of 
training are relatively rare, are relatively rare, that these that once students get to that level, then they are then they are sought after, at, at, at least at, at the entry level to, to get in. Uh, and that that was that was our conclusion uh, on that is is that is that the applicants tend to say, oh well that's good. And in contrast to Asian Americans that who also had the same attributes because the same resumes, we felt that the the other thing that we felt distinguished uh, the Latino applicants is the perception that they might be bilingual, and they could and they, and they could serve the, and they could serve their, uh, the the clientele of the office. Whereas the Asian it being bilingual in an Asian language was less valued uh, by by these companies just because of the because of the numbers of, uh, the numbers of people in the state of California. Yes. Is there any aspect of your affirmative action issue that you feel comfortable? Well, the last time I spoke about the affirmative action issue uh, was in response to uh, Richard Sander, uh, who's from here. Uh, and he has written, for those of you who are not familiar with his writing, he, has, he wrote an article for the Stanford Law Review. Uh, and his, his look, he looked at data of uh, law schools, uh, law school admissions. And his conclusion, if I can, if anybody wants to say his conclusion better than I, please feel, please feel free to go ahead. But my reading of his conclusion was that affirmative action hurt African American law students because they were getting into these schools that maybe they didn't belong in. They were getting in on affirmative action. They were less competitive once they got there. They they got lower grades. They, that that led them to dropping out or at least not feeling as, as good or competitive, and had they gone to the lesser schools, whatever those are, um, then they would have done better and we would have produced more African American lawyers. Now, there are a lot of people who criticize that, uh, that just on the research itself. Uh, in fact, the dean of the Stanford Law School said that they have no control over what the law review prints, but if it was, uh, if it was in one of your journals uh, where there are they are, uh, what's the term when they're? Referee or review. Referee yeah. and, and review, uh, peer review. Peer review. That, it would, that, that, that article wouldn't have survived uh, because of some fundamental issues in the research. My own view, which is something that I printed in the, uh, I, the LA Times printed, um, which got me in trouble with my bosses in Washington, um, was that, it, that, that he really missed the point. The point was not, the point, the point was, in, is because uh, Mark Kenda at Princeton has done some other research saying that when students are adequately supported at those institutions, they do very, very well. And the record that with the University of Michigan Law School in that litigation, again, there's an expert in this room who can, who can speak to it better than I, um, indicates that students, students do well and, and, and they are able to contribute more in their careers uh, as beneficiaries of, of affirmative action. So my own view on affirmative action, which I should say is not necessarily the view of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, uh, is that it's far more beneficial than, than it is not helpful. Uh, and and that the, the record, I think, is clear. Uh, and just in my own personal experience, I, am a ben I feel I'm a beneficiary of affirmative action and having the opportunities, not because I got into schools where I didn't belong, but I got the opportunity to be looked at fairly in my, uh, on my qualifications. And then perhaps 30 years ago, if I applied to Harvard, they would have said, well, no, you're not from, you're, you're not from New England, you're not from Brown <laughs> School, you're not going to go there. Uh, I got in, and, and I was able to now, I've been able to devote my career to immigration and civil rights and working in various communities, uh, so that I feel that if someone were saying, as we, as we establish affirmative action policies, and say we want to help not only the individual beneficiary of it, the person who's going to go to this, med school or law school, uh, but also bring bring up the whole community, then I think I have fulfilled, I am trying to fulfill my responsibility in, in that regard. And which is one other point is if you look at the, at, look at the career records of, of uh, medical professionals, medical professionals who are minorities tend to serve much more minority communities than, than others. So you get the double benefit of not, not only are you not not only are you improving the life of one person who gets the opportunity to go to medical school and save lives, but you're doing it in areas that are otherwise not served. Yes. Um, I just had a question because I've heard a number of groups talk about the proposition to make Los Angeles a safe haven or immigrant um, sanctuary, and I just wanted to know if you could speak a little bit. I'm not even completely clear on what a safe haven means or a sanctuary is, and also what it would mean for. 
San Francisco is a safe haven city, and there are other cities, small and large around the country, that are safe havens. Specifically, what it means is that the local police or other local um, government officials, social security, uh, uh, welfare, caseworkers, teachers, anybody dealing with anybody in local government is not empowered to enforce the immigration laws. And they're specifically author ordered not to report any people who the only problem they think they have, this person has is that they have violated the immigration laws to come into the United States. That's the safe haven means that the local government is not going to enforce the civil rights laws and they're not going to inform the federal government who does enforce the civil rights laws of anybody in, 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 in their midst. Immigration. Immigration, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it says. So. Right, thank you. Um, so that, that the, and, and there are a variety of different uh, proposals on that. Uh, some of which are not are barred by federal law. The federal law says that a local government can't force, can't keep their employees quiet. They can't prohibit them from providing information to to the INS. Um, but some of them, some of them are really, frankly, common sense. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh, a lot of the local police officials who have been asked to enforce the immigration laws, they really don't want to do it. Because of, because of some obvious things. It, it, it reduces the ability to work with the community, uh, to get the cooperation on, on reporting crimes, particularly reporting domestic violence, if there's, if the, if there's a family that has somebody who is not, authorized, uh, not legally authorized in the United States. Uh, and frankly, immigration, enforcing immigration laws is a difficult job. It's difficult for someone who's not trained to know the difference between asylum application, a, a, a green card, uh, a person residing under color of law, all these various categories that people have uh, under immigration, the immigration people understand them, but, but others do not. Uh, so it, it, it's not an effective way to enforce the immigration laws. And um, when, when they do, even when they do, even in our, my experience has been, in, particularly in the Midwest, when local sheriffs would pick people up who are on, uh, on Highway 80, for example, Middle of Midwest, and they're in this county somewhere in Nebraska, and they call up INS, and INS is five hours away. And for INS to send two people out to pick up two people isn't a good use of their resources either. So generally, the, the feeling is that focus the immigration laws enforcement at the federal level, at the border, but within, within the country, within the interior enforcement, there are ways to enforce uh, the immigration laws that don't affect um, the average person. That is, you can enforce the immigration laws by restricting INS involvement to people who have already been convicted of something else. So you do the immigration work, you do it in the jail. You don't do it in the, in the, in the, uh, the street corner. You don't do it in front of a school. You don't do it in, 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 a, in a mall. You do it where people are already a part of the criminal justice system. Now, there are those who oppose that, and who oppose that. Uh, and, um, for example, LA, the Orange County is thinking about expanding the role of expanding the cooperation between local and, and federal. Uh, LA County has just come up with a new policy for the, for the sheriffs and the jails. Uh, so it's really an evolving issue. Yes? Uh, could you give us your take on the relationship between civil rights and the issue about the rights of indigenous population, particularly the solid communities? Do we get to use both sides of the page? <laughs> we are one of the research um, topics we have now at the Commission, the Western Regional Office, is to look at the Arizona-Mexico border. And one of the most, I think, intriguing uh, and underreported issues uh, is with one of the Indian tribes whose land is on both sides of the border. It's in Mexico and it's in the United States. And this tribe and the tribal members are getting hit on two different ways. One is the tribal members who traditionally want to cross back and forth within their own land are being subjected to uh, INS checks, uh, and, and and they're just trying to go from one part of their one part of their land to the other. Is that, what tribe is that? Is that Yaki or no? It's Tawa. Yes. Oh, the Can you say that again? Tohono Right. Tohono <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a, there's a uh, apostrophe in their name, which I can never pronounce. 
so when I can't pronounce it correctly, I tend not to pronounce it. Um, the second problem that this community is having is that everybody else is crossing at that area. So the tribal police are having all these expenditures enforcing the border or, or dealing with people who are breaking other laws while they're on, that, on, on their land. So the members of Congress in Arizona have tried to go to, 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 to the INS to try to pass laws to give them some type of different um, tribal ID card in order to, to be able to cross without, without INS interfering. But and, and the tribe also wants to get some, some money to help pay for their, their police costs. So that, that's one issue that, that we're looking at. We're, we did a hearing uh, in Nogales uh, last summer. We're now writing a report uh, on that. Uh, we have a UCLA intern who's going to be helping us on that. Uh, so uh, we think it'll be a good product. It'll be coming out later in about two or three months. Uh, that's one issue. Um, um, the other issue, of course, is on language. Uh, we have played with various Indian languages. Some, some in Alaska, some in Hawaii, some, some in the Southwest. Uh, and those, uh, what, when people talk about making English the official language of the country and encouraging immigrants to learn English, well, you have, you have a lot of people who are here, uh, mainly elderly, uh, who, are, who are more knowledgeable in some of the Indian languages than they are in English. And they, they have, um, they're not going to be deterred and they're not going to be going back to their homeland because this is their homeland. So there, there are a lot of language and immigration issues that, that are affecting indigenous peoples. Yes? Um, you just mentioned interns, and um, I work at another university, and I'm working um, at a venue room for interns in your office. Yes, we do. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> uh, we very much like to have interns, uh, and we are having, uh, this spring we're having probably three UCLA, UCLA interns. And in the fall, either, either for a long period, uh, a long-term research project, or, or working in our office maybe one or two days a week, we'd love to have uh, students work with us on, on a variety of different projects. The, our region, um, the western region is nine states, from Texas to Hawaii to Alaska, uh, and we're trying to develop different projects focusing on different parts of that region. So we're not just focused only on Southern California. Uh, we're looking at uh, Native American health issues in the state of Washington, looking at Latino children in the state of Idaho. Uh, we did a report a couple years ago called Racism's Last Frontier about uh, racism in Alaska. Uh, we've now gone back to some of the state agencies in Alaska to see, well, what happened since we issued the report? Did anything happen? Has anything been improved? So, those, so uh, our, but our ability to get that work done uh, is greatly dependent upon uh, resources and, and having, uh, if, if we can match up your research interests with our research interests, uh, I think it would be a good experience for all of us. Yes? Um, there's been discussion about um, some of the parts of the Patriot Act um, are going to be expiring, and Congress is trying to decide if they want to roll some of them, you know, continue, roll, to roll some of them over or change it into like a safe act or, you know, whatever else they want to call it. Um, and I just wondered if your office is, has done any work or recommendations regarding. Um, those issues, because those are obviously related to certain races and ethnicities and certain people's rights. And right. We are also working on a report looking at post-9-11 issues for Muslims and, and, uh, and Middle Eastern uh, individuals in California. We did a hearing on that a couple of years ago. Um, but there be, obviously there are a lot of issues that deal strictly with civil rights, and, and some of them really, again, not speaking on behalf of my agency, uh, but some of them deal a lot with INS practices rather than with the Patriot Act itself. Uh, and some people in the administration are saying, well, there's nothing in the Patriot Act that says anything about libraries. You look, you look up and down the Patriot Act, there's nothing in there that talks about library cards. Yet everybody has heard that library records are, are now uh, subject to, to subpoena and, 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 and a search warrant, and that if a librarian gets one of those search, search warrants, they're not allowed to tell anybody except for the, the librarian's attorney. Um, it's sort of a disconnect because even though the word library isn't in the Act, it, it, library records are covered under, under the Act. Similar, similarly, a lot of people complain about the Patriot Act for discriminatory enforcement, but it is in other places, in other parts of INS's practices, uh, rather than strictly speaking the USA Patriot Act. Clearly, Congress is going to be looking at 
either sunsetting some provisions or extending them permanently, uh, and, and civil rights issues certainly will come up. Uh, whether we're able to get our work done on our own research on that before Congress uh, re renews the Patriot Act, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes? Um, there's some settling in or settling down at the national level with the commission uh, and the staff there. I'm wondering whether or not you can describe that a little bit and how it may or may not affect the work that you're doing in the Western region. The commission, if, if anybody's looking for a federal law to examine, they're looking at is that in terms of research, looking at the law that established the Civil Rights Commission would be very intriguing because the Civil Rights Commission was established in the 1950s without any enforcement authority whatsoever. We can't bring anybody to court, we can't adjudicate anything. But what the commission was designed to do was to research issues, expose light on certain issues, and because the have a commanding voice without actually having any authority. And it was successful. A lot of the provisions of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act came as a result of the, the Civil Rights Commission doing the research, going down to the South, talking to people, having giving people a platform to talk about civil rights violations, and then putting into a report recommending to the President and Congress. Fast forward to the 1980s, uh, President Reagan, because he disagreed with some of the work that the Civil Rights Commission fired, some of the commissioners. Uh, that led to an upheaval within the commission, uh, and now we have a system where, as prior to that time, the President appointed members of the commission. Now, the President appoints four members, the majority in the, in the Congress appoints two, and the majority and the minority in the Congress appoint two. So there's a split within the authority of how the commission gets formed, and that carries over into, well, what's the commission going to do? When I got hired, the commission was split four to four, and the staff director was in a, a holdover from the Clinton administration. It was a Clinton appointment like I was. S the second week I was there, the two Democratic commissioners' terms ended. President Bush appointed two Republicans. The first thing they did was remove the staff director. Um, so, so we are now in a transition period, as you alluded to, where we have a new chairman, a new vice chairman, and new members of the commission. Uh, and, and the commission is really looking at, well, what do we think about civil rights in the year 2005? So that is why, in, in a lot of our research, we're going back to sort of, a, while this is working itself out, we're going back to look at issues we've already looked at and, and going back to re-examine them. I mentioned the Alaska, Alaska study. You go back and re-examine, well, did anything happen as a result of our research in Alaska? Uh, we're looking at uh, minorities uh, in entertainment, the film and TV industry. The Commission did a lot of work in the 1970s and 1980s. Window dressing on the set was one of our reports. And we want to go back and see now with NAACP, um, National Hispanic Media Center, uh, Asian American, uh, Asian Pacific American Legal Center have done a lot of work to encourage the studios and the networks to open up uh, slots for directors, writers, uh, performers. Has anything changed? Uh, have the unions had a different role? On, on this issue. So we're going, we're sort of going back into old territory because as my recurring theme is that everything in civil rights changes uh, and, and we're in a new environment, uh, we're focusing on where we've come over the past, past few years. Ultimately, the commission will lay down some new uh, policies and new priorities uh, and then we'll, we'll take up those. But in the meantime, uh, there's certainly a lot for us to do. And again, we'd love to have some interest working on that. Okay. Yes. Um, I work in nonprofit. Um, I do development work for people with
who represents Harlem in New York, for the very reason that his view is that if you have a draft where everybody is subject to the draft, then maybe we'll get some different views of maybe a little more reluctance to go in and, and to go into into war. So there is a civil there's a civil rights position to say, oh, the draft is bad because certain people are going to go in. But also a civil rights position to say the draft is good because then it broadens the impact that our military decisions have on everybody. And uh, so there are, there are two different schools of thought to that. Uh, with the issue of with the issue of the lists that are going out, um, the, the, it's not really clear that it's voluntary. That there, Congress has passed some laws saying that all universities have to turn over the list of their students. Uh, there's and there's a way for at the high school level, there's a way for the parents to opt out of the list. But, right, it's, but they're not getting that information. They're, right, they're not getting that, that information. Um, and there are those who say, well, it's a volunteer army. Everybody who goes in is there voluntarily. Now that is technically true under one definition of, of voluntary. Uh, but when you look at the economic pressures and the other pressures, some of which I've talked about on people of color, then you really have to question how voluntary it is. So it's a really a large issue that uh, I really can't devote much more time to it to give it to give it a full answer. But I'd be happy to stay later and answer anybody else's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for coming. Uh, this talk is part of our effort to build a bridge between the campus and the larger community, so I do encourage you to talk to John after the talk. I also welcome you to help us finish off whatever food we have left there. And again, thank you for coming and have a good afternoon.